This week's episode of Fireside is brought to you by Legends of Belize and Wonders Oddities Expo. you're listening to fireside paranormal podcast my name is jordan klein as always i got a fun show planned out my guest today is dotty the psychic we're going to talk about all kinds of fun things personal stories that she has before we get to her just a few announcements legends of belize is a series about mythical creatures that dwell in the jungles and waters of belize the belizean legends are captured documented and preserved like never before in a comprehensive art series and books with fully colored and detailed images of fine art by artists authors and award-winning animators dismas and grissy g discover the supernatural creatures that await deep in the jungles such as the mysterious dwarf called tata duende with backwards feet known to rip the thumbs off of trespassers or the beautiful shape-shifting woman known to locals as the Ishtabai, who seduces drunks to never be seen again. These creatures and many more can be found in the Legends of Belize books. Learn about the cryptozoological, paranormal, and unexplained creatures that haunt Belize. Be fascinated. Be terrified. Belize. The Legends of Belize books are available in print and ebook. Buy your copy from your favorite online bookstore such as Amazon, KDP, Apple Books, and many more. Also, be sure to visit legendsofbelize.com. Did you know that 16% of Americans believe in Bigfoot? When they founded 16% Nation, they had no idea how popular it would become. Their products are designed to appeal to fans of all ages who appreciate the wit, humor, and mystery that surrounds these legendary creatures. For years, they felt alone in the cryptid enthusiasm, but now, thanks to 16% Nation... They know they're not alone. They've created a community where like-minded individuals who share the fascination with Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and all things cryptid. They're proud to now be the world's number one destination for cryptid-themed collectibles, apparel, and more. Go to 16nation.com and put code FIRESIDE at checkout for free shipping. 16% Nation is a new affiliate for the show, so definitely go show them some love. I also want to give a big shout out to American Paranormal Magazine. They've always been really big supporters of Fireside, and uh, I want to appreciate them. So if you get the chance, go to paranormalzine.com, check out their latest issue, and uh, give them some support. All right, let's get to this week's featured story. This week's story comes in from AC. My name is AC, and that's my real name. Um, I'm from Moundsville, West Virginia. Uh, my story stems from an a- antique photo we found at Sibs. It's a consignment store slash antique store right near Wheeling, West Virginia. So I walked in with my mother-in-law, and I was just immediately drawn to this really tattered picture frame of this like really pale lady, and I resonated with her because everybody that meets me tells me I'm super-duper pale. So I was like, I just want a pale lady. Um, So I got home, and I noticed that the picture frame was, like, super-duper decrepit and needed some work. So I decided that I was going to take it apart and try to restore it to its former glory. And the picture frame was oval, and it had, like, beading around around it. So I took it apart and discovered that there was children. (laughs) Children. The photo itself was actually just, like, a photo that was blown up and cut out. And what I didn't mention before is that when I went back to Sibs about a year later, I found the original picture of the Anne, the lady that was actually cut out. So they had the original photo of, of the Anne girl, but my daughter lovingly dubbed her Anne. So now everybody that comes over pays shrine <laughs> to Anne, who lives above our fireplace, or not our fireplace, our island, and she's just at home. So every time my mother-in-law will be like, how's Anne? <laughs> All right, that's my story. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you so much, AC. If you want your story to be one of our featured stories, make sure you give me an email, firesideparanormalpodcast at gmail.com, and we'll get you on. Hey there, curiosity connoisseurs. Are you intrigued by all things strange, weird, and unusual, but too embarrassed to talk with your friends and family about it? Well, we're your family now. Join me, chronically curious Katie. And me, combat veteran Chris 
as we don our tinfoil hats and question everything. From crazy mysteries, out-of-this-world conspiracies, and the unbelievable happenings all around us. Let's try to stay sane as we laugh and explore together through our podcast, Stop Thinking With Your Butt. Wherever you like to listen. All right, I want to get to my guest. Join me by the fire as we welcome Dottie the Psychic. Dottie, how are you today? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? I'm so good. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. I'm really excited. Um, you know, we do some conventions together. So we we do talk and and just we have stories off of camera. You know what I mean? Like we, we talk yeah. without the mic. So I figured, you know, it was about time. We got to chit chat a little bit with Mike. Yeah, I think I told you some of, some of my more interesting stories. I mean, I've got a lot of, I actually, you know, it's funny because as a psychic, you're kind of tuned into the spiritual world. So uh-huh. the stuff that rattles most people bones, you're like, oh, it's Tuesday. <laughs> it's just a normal Tuesday. Like, yeah, you saw some, oh, I saw somebody walking. I saw a shadow figure walk by. I'm like, say hi. <laughs> What do you want me to tell you? <laughs> All right. So I, I want to get into a little bit because there's a lot of people that claim psychic ability and there's a lot of people out there that don't, that might have it. So like, what was it that really stuck out to you that said, you know what, there might be something to what's going on with me. So honestly, here's the thing about most psychics are not like professional psychics. You get a lot of people who turn cards for their friends or whatnot and do a little uh, bit of yeah. this and that but also work real jobs, usually in the caring field. And in fact, there's a, uh, it's almost a trope at this point where professional psychics are burnouts from the medical field. (laughs) And you are? A burnout from the medical field. I was an LPN for 10 years. That was a decade of my life. I cannot get back. (laughs) I don't regret it because some of my best stories do come from that time period. Uh, Cause I worked long-term care. I worked in a nursing home on night shift. Oh, wow. You've seen some things then. Oh yeah. You know, after a certain, it's so funny because I remember like the first few times I saw something that really looking back now after, you know, not being quite so green, I'm like, yeah, that was, that was Tuesday, but that's that first real shock. And I remember going up to the CNA and being like, uh, I just heard a, I think it was like a disembodied voice or a knocking or something, or I saw, I think I saw something, some something of that nature. It wasn't anything huge, but it was definitely enough that it was, should not have been there. And it definitely was. And I'm like, I was like telling CNA, so I'm like, did you see that crap? And it's like, yeah, what of it? I'm like, are you kidding me? So, so you were not. I guess, tapped into your, you know, abilities while you were working in the nursing home? Like this was, Uh, this was when it was coming on. Um, I kind of have known something was different pretty much since some of my first memories are actually of seeing ghosts, you know, but you, even if you're raised in a very open family, my family was very open. Like we had this game, uh, when I turned 13, one of dad's friends gave me all these tarot cards because she's mm. got the gift. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And dad, the cards scared my dad. He considered them a crutch. So rather than he took all my cards away, but we'd start playing these weird games in the house. Like he would buy stuff off of eBay, swords yeah. and stuff. And he would have the family like hold it and ask us what we got from it. And I'll never forget there was one time he got this sword and it's eBay. This thing, I, uh, whatever was attached to it did not like women. We ended up making him take it out of the house and keep it in the van and sell it as soon as possible. (laughs) Like we don't care if you have to make a loss on it. We don't feel comfortable with that on our house. I mean, mom, mom was a medium. So there were times where it felt like our house was a bit of like a grand central station, but like a lot of that was feeling. And, you know, there are time periods in life where you're so sucked into your own life that you do kind of turn down your connections. Um, And in the nursing home, it got hard because now I'm dealing with people who are trying to live out their last chapter with as much dignity as possible. Yeah, yeah. You know, it very much becomes a concern of of quality over quantity in time and dignity and living 
So that's a lot for a person with powers, or well, not powers, with a gift to take on. And I've seen a lot of people burn out from not being able to handle that. And one of the ways to handle that was to sort of just learn to shield yourself, kind of turn it down. Yeah. But you couldn't, <laughs> sometimes it was strong enough, nobody could turn it down. I'll never forget one time we were all sitting, it was like 3 a.m. And we were all sitting around, we gotten all our work done, everything was cool. And uh, we're sitting around telling ghost stories at 3 a.m. And we're like, yeah, all this. And it wasn't like ghost stories from like long distant past. This was just like stuff we'd experienced in our in our careers. And this red cloud just passed by the open doors. And we're like, did you see that? And yeah, I was like, oh, yeah, that's just the red. And one of the girls that had been working there for a long time was like, oh, yeah, that's the red woman. She shows up every now and again, oh. usually right before we have like a, we go into a. Uh, a death cycle. Those were always the weirdest. So what is a death cycle? A death cycle. Okay. So if you work in a place where people die on a semi-regular basis, where you're, where you're hand, where, you know, you're handling end of life care is what it's called. Palliative care. Some yeah, yeah. of them, but often just geriatrics people, uh, die and they usually go, it, it's almost like death has a short bus. So it's like, okay, I've got three seats. So at least three people are going you know, I'm not making this stop for nothing kind of deal. And, like, it was almost like this presence would kind of hang around. Anybody who's ever worked the healthcare field will tell you that, like, anything that has, like, a motion sensor on it, hand sanitizers, towel dispensers, sinks, they will just, they're, <laughs> they'll just go off. Really? Yeah. It was so bad at times. Like, there was a hand sanitizer dispenser right before you walked in the back door because the staff would the staff parking lot was behind the building and so you had to go through this one door and right by the door was this hand sanitizer dispenser and that hand sanitizer dispenser just before we go into a death cycle where we'd lose two or three people at least well usually at least three people and there was a like one you expected one you didn't expect and one in the hospital i was gonna ask like how many how many would happen at a time at least three. Sometimes it get up, you know, if something happened, if something was going on, like there was a flu or something going through, there might be more or, you know, and just the weirdest stuff would happen. I've seen that like, uh, like terminal lucidity. I've seen that a couple of times. That was, that was a strange one to see. Um, but the hand Ter sanitizer. Terminal lucidity. Out. Terminal lucidity. Yeah, I'm going to throw a lot of facts at you real quick. Oh, yeah, so, you're using a lot bigger words than what my brain can handle. Terminal lucidity. <laughs> you dumb, is dumb it up for me, Daddy. <laughs> so when uh, when somebody's been sick for a long time and they're not able to function, uh, a lot of times people who have, like, Alzheimer's or we had one lady who didn't speak a word for a decade suddenly oh, starts talking to us. And she told us, like, all about her life. And, she, I mean, she still wouldn't talk to everybody, but there was a couple of us that she just opened up to all of a sudden one day. And she seemed really happy, where she'd been very, very kind of almost morbid, lurky kind of her for 10 years, this woman had been. She, like, that's a sad story. Like, um, she'd ended up in this nursing home from California because she'd moved out to live with a lady, but she didn't take care of her diabetes. And the, the woman that she'd lived with was like, if you're not taking care of yourself, I can't take care of you. And she was a ward of the state. Wow. So she was very isolated in this nursing home. And that's not the best of vibe. A nursing home's not someplace you want to live. Nobody, nobody wants to go to the nursing home because it is restrictive. And it's, it's, we make it the best experience we can, but it's still a place where people are living out the last chapter of their lives because they're not able to stay at home for whatever reason, no family too much. And, and people who very much love their family would have to put people in their home because they were not capable of giving the care that that person required anymore. So she ended up in the nursing home and she just stopped talking. Like she almost like she'd made the conscious decision not to speak to anybody. Nobody had heard this woman speak for like I want to say like a decade. Some of the older CNAs were really shocked. Um, I think I'd been there for five years and never heard her talk. Yeah. But then she just, she just opened up to like two or three of our CNAs. Like she had her favorites on night shift and her favorites on day shift. And 
two or three days, she talked like I think it was like a week. She was talking to us. She was telling me stories about her life and everything. And then right at shift change one day, the CNA came and got me. She says she looks pale. She's making weird noises. <laughs> I'm like, I went in there and she's she's obviously dying. She went very quickly right at shift change between the two shifts that she liked. Oh wow. Yeah. I'm now like, now. At this time, I know you said that you kind of toned it down while you were working there because of everything going on. Like, could you tell when something like this was going to happen? Like, is that kind of yeah. in your gifting? Uh, it wasn't just my gift. It was so very obvious that even somebody who was skeptical, you don't, <laughs> I don't think you could do long-term care nursing, especially on night shift for very long and and not have some questions about how the universe actually works because we can sit there and philosophize and most days maybe very it's easy to think outside in this real world that there's nothing else going on if you can't if you don't have at least a little bit of the gift it's, it's more like i have a heightened sense i think everybody has some sense and then there's some things yeah, that like physical things you can't deny happened Especially, especially like all that. We had a computer set fire one time. Like you can't, you can't not notice that. Like it started smoking and everything. And that was right after they took out the hand sanitizer that <laughs> emptied itself so many times that they stopped refilling it. Like next time, just, just fill the thing a quarter full and leave it out there. Yeah. Like if it wants to be known, it's going to be known. Oh the, yeah. The electronics would go on the frit. Um, people would hear disembodied voices. You start seeing stuff. One of the moments that really got me, um, I had this resident who had Alzheimer's and she was always like, she, when I first got in there, she always wanted to go home to her husband. Uh, Norman was his name. Um, and she'd yell for him and then she, and then her, condition progressed and she kind of reverted further back and she said she wanted to go home to her mom and her dad so I hadn't heard about Norman in like a year she wasn't looking for Norman she was looking for her mommy and daddy she's like gone back to like eight years old and then one day she is just like we cannot get her uh, like the CNAs come and get me this is how all my great stories start the CNAs came and get me because I was one of the nurses that you could find pretty reliably you know, I, I believed in what I did. I, I believed it was kind of a holy task to take care of, of people in their final stages of life. So I, uh, so I go in there to pull her out, and she is just, she is fighting us. This woman in a wheelchair is fighting us to get into this other patient's, this other client's resident, it was resident, other resident's room. I've got a whole history of <laughs> Anyway, so she's fighting to get into this resident's room. The resident's at lunch. Um, this is like the day before I went on vacation. So I'm like, okay, I get through. The, we finally pull her out, but she's screaming, Norman's right there. I got to get to Norman. He's right there in that bed. And the bed was empty. Like, because the client, the resident who, who lived in that bed was off at activities. And not named Norman, right? And not named Norman at all. She was... Uh, just like a, she was in fairly decent health she was disabled because she'd had a stroke so she had difficulty speaking the swallowing things like that wheelchair bound she just needed help living but she was uh, she was stable there was no reason to think that anything was going to happen to this particular resident she was she was not on the list of people we thought were going to go uh but she ended up uh <laughs> She wasn't supposed to have bread, and while I was on vacation, she choked to death. The resident who lived in that space died. Um, that one was a wild one. That one stuck with me for a long time. I'm wow. like, well, that happened. Because she was fighting. She hadn't brought up Norman. The, the resident we've had to drag out of the room hadn't brought up her dead husband for literally a year she had she was not she, i don't think she remembered him at that point we oh, thought wow. she'd like regressed back to the point where she didn't she was eight years old yeah yeah um but she was like screaming he's right there i gotta get to him he's right there 
Um, and I don't think she died during that death cycle, I, but I, it wasn't too long after that that she also passed away. Now, when they go, because you always hear about like hospitals and things like that, just, I don't know if I want to say being more haunted, right? But there's so much death and emotion and things like that that happen at these places. So in a nursing home, right, where literally people are going to live out their last stage of life, do you find that there's a lot more staying around? Oh, yeah. Well, okay, so it's a little different. Like, if you go into a place that used to be a hospital, used to be a nursing home, you're going to get activity. Uh-huh. That activity that you get in a in a place that is closed is never going to match up to the energy and and craziness that's going on when you've got living people passing. You know, um, maybe you just don't notice it as much as as much when when right. they're living and when it's full. I think here's the thing, like there. I've really like I've got some theories on how it all works, but um, like because I went to the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum and it was creepy. It set my teeth on edge. It definitely had that vibe, but nothing like when I was working night shifts. Part of it is because when you're working night shifts, you're there every day. You're putting in as yeah. much of that energy as they are like you don't realize how much you're feeding the ghosts while you're at work just trying to get through the med pass because that med pass i don't care how slick a nurse you are if you have a rough night you know you're putting out a lot of energy i i just want to point out because i i don't i don't want to just slide past this i I love that term you just use you're feeding the ghosts with your energy yeah yeah I, i love that I Somebody out there make a t-shirt. I love it. <laughs> Feeding the ghost. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Well, I mean, that's a kind of a lot of times when you're helping to channel something, you're you are as a psychic, one of the things I've really had to learn. One of the things that that separates the amateurs from the professionals is being able to prov- to take care of yourself, be able to maintain yourself. Because a lot of it is draining. And that's kind of what happened to me. I got drained to the point where I, I lost empathy for other people. And oh, that's, wow. yeah, that was, that was not good. That was a whole, <laughs> that was a whole thing. Um, but you are kind of giving energy over. As I, I noticed, like, once people died, their spirits were allowed to pass sometimes they'd get stuck and you'd have to like you know hey honey you're you you're dead now you don't have to go you can go home <laughs> see the bright light go home so i want to ask you because it sounded like and i'm, I'm kind of digging back to what you were talking about a few minutes ago um with your family right you're you're I throw stuff at people no you're good i like it i like it but it, your family is all to an extent, it sounds like uh, psychic as well, right? Do you yeah. do you think it's more genetic? Do you think that this is something that I know you said like everybody kind of has, but do you think it's more of a genetic uh, uh, occurrence? I think more because I think you know this is one of those questions that I can't personally argue because I do have like a lineage of psychic. Like, my great-grandmother on my mother's side uh, was a spiritualist. She, like, she was actually a pastor in a spiritualist church, which is, um, they're the ones who, like, as part of their service, provide free mediumship. So, I mean, like, she did that. And then my grandmother on my mom's side uh, would call every time they tried to be intimate as a newly wed couple. She could call, like, <laughs> like clockwork. I I have kids that kind of, that that try to figure that one out too, you know. <laughs> and I do think that uh, embracing it is part of what makes me stronger. The fact that it is a part of our family and we accept it makes us more willing to develop it versus trying to suppress it. 
I think a lot of people see and hear more than they're willing to admit. I agree um, with that. I, I, everybody has some sort of, even like, I've seen some stone cold atheists pull some stuff that I'm like, I don't know how you did that, but I'm just going to stay over here out of the way. Um, especially if there are people who are, who are like, I make my own will or I make my own luck. I will bend this to my will. People like that, uh, they have a natural magic and things will fall into place in some weird ways. Uh, just because they willed it to be that way. And I'm like, okay, um, just remind me not to piss you off. <laughs> now for you, like how would you kind of explain your giftings? Cause I know you say you see things, you hear things. Would you like, when you see things, are they like people there? Are they shadows? Like you, you mentioned like a red cloud. It's funny because that's something that you don't necessarily have to have the gift to pick up on. Like, there are things that are so obvious that you don't necessarily have to be gifted. My gift is very much being able to look forward, to look into people's lives. And it's hard to separate what is, like, psychically attained and what is attained through just having talked to a lot of people. Um, so I think of my gift as being more a gift of compassion than of being singularly psychic. So That's if, what, okay, yeah. But you see things as well, though, right? Oh, yeah, all the time. Mediumship, I tell you what, every time it happens, I'm like, I don't offer mediumship as a, as a, as something people can just order online. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, I sell my time. I sell readings. These are the things I can guarantee I can do. I can look into the crystal ball, and I can read your palm, and I can read your cards. I can't guarantee somebody's going to pick up the phone. Um. Because there's a lot of reasons why the spirit may not be able to uh, speak directly to you right now. If they've just recently passed, they may still be going through sort of a deprogramming on the other side. They may yeah. not be ready to come back and speak to people yet. Or, you know, if there's something that happened between you that, that spirit's got to, you know, they got to go through what they got to go through on the other side, too. So I never offer it. But every time, I swear, I'm like people will say, do you do mediumship? I'm like, well, it's not something I normally offer. And about that time, I'll see somebody like not really here, like not in the physical world, but in my mind's eye off to the left. A lot of times people will just show up. I'm like, hi. <laughs> and, and I always feel like I'm kind of crazy. I've just learned to embrace, embrace the madness in a way. That's Fair. kind of my whole brand. I'm like, well, uh, this is my life. This is where I live. I could tone it down, but why would I? <laughs> and so, like, every time I'm like, okay, let me describe this person, this, this, and this. And a lot of times people are, like, confused at first. And then I'll hit on, like, a detail. Like, somebody will be pointing something out. They'll be like, look at this or that. Or some I had a lady come through so clearly the other day. And... I was doing just like a romance life reading for this guy over text. No, no, it was a phone call. It was a phone call. And it is a lot easier to do phone calls than text. I hate text. Oh, That's sure. But I can do it. I don't know. Sometimes I'm just like, okay, I just kind of ask the, the thing that connects us all what this person needs to hear to have a happier life, to live better. What would help improve this person's earthly existence? And sometimes those messages are a little rough. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, well, let me tell you how you're screwing your life up. Um, <laughs> let's see if we can, let's, let's talk about the problem and we'll figure out some solutions. Um, but yeah, so like that's more the gift is being able to tap into that sort of energy. And it's something I think really genuinely connects us all. And there have definitely been times in my life where I felt disconnected from that. And I was usually in like a depressed state and it's, it's hard for me to even get out of bed or things like I have depression. I have anxiety and depression. And, and I think a lot of us do. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a lifelong struggle, but by using my gift, getting tapped into that, doing self care is how I'm able to maintain my, what I do for a living, but it also helps pull me back out. 
Like I would be doing this anyway. And it's nice to be able to help other people with it as well. And I think because I'm willing to help other people with it, then the spirits are willing to help me yeah. work on it. Would, would you say that, that that's kind of like a side effect? I don't know. I think that it's more like, I think that our psychic abilities are a natural extension of compassion for each other. Okay. Okay. I really do think that anybody could be psychic. I think when people sit down, they're like, okay, I'd like something psychic to happen right now. I'm like, um, you know how it happens. Not how it usually goes down. Like, you can do that, but you're going to have to get in some weird arcane shit that you got to be willing to strap in for, and you will have that experience, but it might drive you crazy. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to take that train? Because it goes crazy town. Okay, so I'm I'm definitely going to ask you a question kind of on that, right? Okay. Because when, when people go, and I see you at conventions, right? Right. So, like, people come up to you, and these conventions are all day or all weekend, and it's like, hey, you have to tap in and be ready to go now like how how does that work you know what honestly it's harder to work the freaking hotline by a lot (laughs) honestly i love the rapid fire readings like events because what i can do is i can sit down tap in and then i'm already tapped in the next person comes up goes and you know that's a whole thing because it's it's funny because i see the same reactions i'm like that's weird but okay like you have the karens which are inevitably energy vampires yeah yeah. Yeah. uh you always get like one but yeah you basically you tap in in the morning you make sure you ground so this is like some some professional um you're like you're like giving the goods now right oh hell yeah you know i got a secret I'm I'm a great confessor. I tell my whole story, so I have got room for everybody else's. Everybody <laughs> else's. English hard. Um, I'm also like a personality. Like I've got a YouTube channel, the whole thing. So it doesn't serve me to try and be quiet because apparently this is the stuff that people need to know. Yeah. Right. Um. So you tap in in the morning. Yeah. I'm glad you got me back on track. Uh. To kind of tap into the morning and make sure I take my shoes off. Like if you see me walking around the convention, you'll see a lot of times I might be barefoot or in my socks. And a lot of times the first thing I do take off those rubber soles because that's an insulator and you're trying to make a circuit uh, between like the higher energies because you're pulling, you're kind of pulling energy. Because if you know, it's like if you get a room full of psychics reading, it doesn't matter how cold it is outside. It's warm in that building. And a lot of times when I go to kind of disconnect for the day, um, because, you know, I kind of set up the sacred space. I'm setting up my booth. I make sure I put my two chairs out there so people can sit down and get comfortable. And that's kind of, those are places where people, those are kind of in the space that you set up. Um, So as long as you're there and you're pulling that energy, people will be naturally drawn in usually. A lot of times they'll just come and sit down. And so there's different tricks to try and get more tapped in. Like, I, you know, you work with it, you know, like any other tool or anything else you've got to maintain and work with it. Sometimes it's finicky. Like I, I like to tell people I'm like a five-year-old laptop. Sometimes I got to clean the Ram. It's <laughs> fine. It still works. Just takes, you just right got to leave it plugged in, right? That's right. <laughs> got to leave it plugged in. Um, but you know, you create that space and in that space, you sort of open up the light, like the place that we return to is always with us. We're an extension of this sort of existential web of kind of light. It's, you know, there's a yeah, by nature, it's undefinable, so why am I sitting here trying? Basically, that's what I'm tapping into. Okay, yeah, no, it's fun to hear you try to explain it, though. It is fun, because it's beautiful. It's beautiful, and it's where we, we all come from. We're not like... I like the... I think it's... I don't know if it's Buddhist, Hindu, it's not... But basically, that we are an extension of prana. God, Hindu. Prana. And, like, there are different parts of us. And... 
the piranha comes down, we go through our life cycle, and then when we die, we stick around for a little bit, and but that piranha just retracts back into itself. And their idea of a ghost was people who didn't cross yet, which I have some theories. I like the difference between ghosts and spirits, because it seems like ghosts are more likely to still carry some serious issues from life. Like, they are, they're the ones who either... Either, like, there's been an energetic imprint left behind. I like the the, the echoes. Um, what are those called? Like, but anyway, that's my kind of ghost. Where it's Like residual like, kind of stuff? Or? Yes, residual. Okay. Like, residual and intelligent. There we go. That's what I was trying to get at. I actually did a video on uh, Death the Spirit, where I kind of broke down kind of what I believe and some of my better stories. Um, that's on my YouTube channel. I actually did two deaths. There's going to be a third one that's on grief, but I, I have to be in a headspace to work on it and all that. So it may come out before I die. Maybe. I have a really random question. And this okay. is, this is, uh, the video, like we're video chatting, but this video does not get posted anywhere. It's, it goes as soon as we hang up. Right. Right. Are you, are you, do you live alone or you got somebody in there? Uh, oh, I got people in the house okay i thought i saw a head pop out of the corner there and i'm like oh, <laughs> oh we got dogs we got no there's an actual person over there <laughs> in the flesh Hello. oh yeah i hear i was like huh if she's living alone she might want to know that a head just popped out of the wall there <laughs> honestly at this point it wouldn't shock me i tell you what though like once you start to open up because i think this does this is a skill that develops over many lives at least in my theory and that's what it is because i try to be open to everybody's theory everybody believes what they believe for a reason i believe what i believe because i've seen some crazy shit um but i believe in like past lives and i believe that the skills that you carry over from life to life. You don't get any of the details, but you get these skills that you come in with. Okay. Um, so this is something that, because my mom and I had talked about past lives, my sister and I have talked about past lives, some of my best friends, my closest friends, I'm like, I feel like we've known each other for a thousand years. I'm like, maybe that would explain a lot. Um, coming in with weird ideas like I, I mean I had some weird ideas growing up that I know looking back I did not get from my family because it's okay it's like I can blame TV but I don't think so <laughs> I'm like uh oh well and then I had like a, a past life regression and I'm like oh well that's where that came from I actually had like a past life flashback not too long ago that was an experience How I've did never that work? had before that was awful that was awful. It was terrible. I flashed Well, you know back. I want details. Um, okay, so I've been to the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum twice. And the first time was like a day trip, which is a whole different kind of energy. And I have this theory of, of nourishment and suppression for, for like spiritual activity. Like, if you're the more with it you are, the more your brain is going to filter things out and sort of suppress the ability to be seen, the ability to manifest, or it makes us ignore things where, but our presence there, our intentions for looking is feeding those spirits. We're offering that energy up. Like, I want to see you. I am concentrating. Like where focus goes, energy flows. Um, which is another idea for a t-shirt. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I got that. That's some Western occultist bullshit right there. I tell you what, like uh, <laughs> occultism, self-help for weirdos. Works for me. Uh, <laughs> my boyfriend laughing at me. <laughs> um, so yeah, you're putting out that inner, that intention of seeing something. So you're putting out the energy for something to manifest, but because you're expecting it so much because and so many people are expecting it so much that it's hard for something to manifest it's also why you know if you go in a place and everybody's expecting to see a ghost and everybody's expecting a ghost but nobody sees a ghost until it's one poor asshole who didn't keep up with the group i'm like oh so now you've got this super flux all that intention to see something has finally got that release and you can't your energy is not strong enough 
to stop everybody else's energy that's fed into it. So it's able to manifest. <laughs> and then, you know, then there's a will. Like, a lot of these things, if it's intelligent, it has a will of its own. And they don't necessarily want to talk to you. They may just want to get their jump scare. It's funny, because I was talking about trans allegheny lunatic asylum. Um, the ghosts there were pretty friendly. Like, they were slamming doors and laughing at me. Getting their jump scare in. I'm like, well, you know, I'm here for it. Clear up until, like, the, the first time I went into the Law of War was during a day shift. was during a day trip. And we didn't see anything on that trip. But the moment I stepped in the lobotomy ward, I started having this ice pick migraine, which is not something I've ever had in my life. Okay. I thought it was my face with sinuses. Huh? I said, okay, okay. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, maybe being a psychic, I'm just channeling something. But after that moment, like, I'd always... I'd always seen it on videos. I'm like, that's close. I'd love to go. And somebody invited me to that first time. And then, like, the second time, I'm like, it wasn't quite an obsession with the place, but it was uh, intrigue. Like, I have to go back. Okay. I know I need to go back, and I don't want a bunch of people around me when I do. I'm like, I will be the crazy asshole to walk in the, in the, in the, uh, psych ward alone at night I'd, i i walk in the graveyard at night which is actually a pretty peaceful place usually um let me talk about graveyards in a minute i love graveyards uh so we're taking the tour before we're allowed to go loose and check out all the places we basically have free random places as long as we don't damage anything no fires no ouija boards I'm like yeah don't bring anything new into the house <laughs> Like, we've got a good ecosystem here. We, we were friendly with the spirits now. Let's not screw that up. Let's not. Let's not. Like, I, I can abide by those. I just want to talk to the people who are already here because I, I need to find some things out. Uh, so we go into the lobotomy ward. And, like, I knew we were getting, like, I, had, I started having this, like, just extreme deja vu. Like, things kind of took on a different look a little bit. Really? I know I know it's kind of hard because I didn't really get a vision. I didn't get any. I didn't see anything with this. It was all in my body. Uh, like I started having. I've got anxiety attacks left over from working in the nursing home and just just ignoring all sense of self care. Uh, so I still occasionally will just just lose my shit for no reason. Pee and cry, be back in five. And that's what I usually tell people. Like I'm like, <laughs> like this smile is fake, and I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> like my face will be leaking, my face is red, but still got this creepy smile. Like just give me five minutes. I'll, let me go pull my shit together. But I started like, we got down. Like we're going through this place, and I'm really having a great time because the the spirits are poking fun at me, and I'm happy to react. I think it's great. Like they, they really are. They're like slamming doors and laughing at me. I'm like. That's funny. Everybody's having a good time. We get down to the floor where we're starting to walk towards the lobotomy worm. And the root moment we we had to cross through like the safe zone, like there we had a little like um, base area, um, and we had to cross through it to get over into that area. And the tour guide's like, "I really hate this area. I don't like to go down here. But you all paid money, so let's go down here." I'm like. I don't really want to go. I started having an anxiety attack the moment we passed through the safe area and opened the door to walk to the lobotomy ward. Um, and the whole time I'm like, my, I'm anxious. Like I'm starting to have all the anxiety symptoms. Like, uh, but I don't, I don't have the the feel of it. It's it's kind of hard to explain unless you're somebody who's had anxiety disorder. There's like that point with the racing thoughts. I didn't really yeah. have the racing thoughts. I had the, the the psychosomatic feelings, like like my body's tight. I am starting to shake. I just want to get out of that space. But I'm like, I've got to do this. I get down there and like I never had a vision with it. I never had a vision with it. But I was just like, I took a moment. It was almost like I started started the thousand yard gaze. I'm like, I like my body froze up and I Aaron who was with me my boyfriend he, he said my name and I didn't respond and then I like look over and I point to this area I'm like I died right there 
that's where I died. And I started freaking out. Oh, wow. I'm like, you don't understand. I died right there. And I f- nearly threw up. I thought about passing out. I'm like, this, this, like I, I'm going to lay down. I want to lay down. <laughs> I would like to lay down. I nearly laid down on the floor. I'm like, really? And like, I knew I'd gone there to shoot a video. I didn't go there to do that. <laughs> it's not at all what I had expected. But like, I could feel like, um, I know what happened. I don't know when it was. I don't know who I was. But I remember that I had been in there for depression I had volunteered to be lobotomized because it, the depression was so bad. My mental health was so bad that I was willing to do anything to fix it. And they said that this was going to fix it. And I, 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 like, I felt comfortable through the whole place. Like I'd been there a million times. I loved the place. Like even in the creepier places, I'm like, I, and I was getting like flashes of things. Like yeah, they were yeah. showing me things, but like, you know, I was comfortable with it until we got down to the lobotomy ward. And then like, and then after that, like I'm exploring, I'm like, I really want to come down here and hang out by myself, but I really, really don't. So I'm like, I, I kind of got what I needed. We had to go back. I had to sit down. I mean, it took me a minute to pull my shit together. And I want to give the crew that went with me, my friends there handled that like pros. They gave me space. My boyfriend and my sister came and checked on me, but they gave me space. They're like, how are you doing? Are you okay? And I'm like, okay. And once I calmed down, we went back out and explored. But that, like, I know that I got a cerebral infection from, like, I didn't die from the lobotomy itself. Yeah. I was unable to move or do anything, but it was the infection that killed me because it created this pressure that... I just, I remember, I felt like my, I felt like there's these things called contractures where um, if you don't move at all, like if you lose function of a limb, a lot of times you'll see when stroke victims, their hands will curl up. And that's because the muscles themselves will, will, will uh, contract. And they're very hard to deal with. But I felt my body do that a little bit. Like I felt myself curl in. I have a question. Yeah. Right. So you, you felt this, you didn't see anything. I didn't see right? anything. Like usually I get like a picture that's almost like, it's funny because I describe it. It's almost like a picture on the inside of my skull. Like right, it's usually yeah, like yeah. here or here, but it's more of like, almost like a memory, but I can, there's like a spatial awareness to it. Like this is where dead people go. This is where visions go. And over here's my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> but with 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 this with going into a place like that is there any chance that that could have been a type of possession I do not believe so because I've had other spirits show me their death Okay I've had that happen before I've had them like okay well tell me how you died a lot of times the oh, like this is one I I I'm hesitant to talk about because there are real people with real trauma out there and describing something that you've experienced as a psychic. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. You 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 don't have to dig into stuff like that. I I think it's important for people to hear, but also you have to respect that there are living people with living trauma in this life. So something that happened in your past life, you may still be dealing with it, but it's not the same as living trauma. You know, it's not the same as if it had happened in this life and you had survived or something like that. But so there's this uh, one time, there were two times that a spirit showed me their death and they were both just completely rattling, but it was not like that at all. Because the first time I went in there and I thought I had that ice pick headache, I thought, okay, I'm in the lobotomy ward. It would make sense, but it didn't feel like it was coming from outside. Yeah. Like this wasn't something being shown to me. This was inside me. This was something that was happening to me. Wow. Whereas when I saw like the death visions, one of them I did get like a first person view, but it was like being in a video game almost. Like I was, or it was like watching a movie. This guy was, uh, it was a Vietnam vet who had gotten pinned down in the open and I watched my buddy to the right drop. I saw the buddy to my left drop and then fade to black. And that was the whole thing. And then I woke up out of that and the guy's standing next to my bed. I'm like, okay, buddy, go home. There's the door. Thank you for that. And get, (laughs) 
Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the gift that my mother had because she was she was a natural medium and she's the one who showed me how to open the door. She's like, you just sort of you feel the light and then you literally and you imagine a door and open it and then the spirits can pass through that. And that's a way because that gives I think in a way you're creating a visual indicator for something that is so beyond our understanding in the physical world that when you die, you're not ready to accept that that temporal shift, that existential change um, where people who kind of studied it and been around it and worked with it, you're like, okay, well, like my brother, he he was also a natural medium. He worked with spirits his whole life. And when he passed, he was, by the time he had died, he had already crossed over. He knew what to expect. Yeah. Like, I think he may, have, I don't think he was stuck around for a day. I, he just was like, well, let me go check in. I'll be back kind of deal. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I do want to ask you, because we are out of time. Uh, you said you do YouTube and things like that. Like, start plugging your socials. How can people find you? What's the best way to get up and follow what you're doing? I didn't realize I'd been talking that long. I just, like, dumped <laughs> all that on you, didn't I? Like, that's just my life. <laughs> I tell these stories all the time. Like, I feel like I shortchanged you because there's way more detail to a lot of them. But no, no, we're about to hit on Patreon, too. So if anybody <laughs> wants the second half, they got to jump on Patreon. <laughs> all right, you know what? And you can check out my Patreon, too, at D-O-T-T-I-E, the psychic.com. Uh, that's my website. Um, I do have a YouTube. I've got Dottie the Psychic YouTube. I've also got Madame Tortuga's Lounge, where I do a lot of local community things. Like, I've got Psychic Shopping, which I tried to go to a lot of the metaphysical shops and help plug them. And uh, a lot of people who are also psychics or Reiki workers. Or if you're interested in being on that show, let me know. Uh, what what's what's the best way to let you know on that? Is, is there a preferred message or, a, like, a message board or... Uh, email or you can reach me through Facebook. You can reach me through email D O T D I E the psychic at Gmail. If you're interested, um, I try to, ch I try to answer my chats pretty quickly on Facebook. Those are good place. Uh, I think there is a place to, uh, send me a message through the website. A lot of what I do, I go out and I look for people. I haven't really had a whole lot of people look for me. But definitely, if you like Patreon, you know, if you if you pay me five bucks, I'll definitely pay more attention to you. Not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it is, man. That's just where it is. <laughs> if, you, if you want her attention, that's how to get it. <laughs> I'm broke. I'm trying to make... Yeah, I tell you what, like the psychic bit I got down. I love the psychic bit. I actually, like sitting here right next to me, I've got a guide to palmistry so I can learn more about the psychic bit. The business bit, the electronic bit, I'm like, psychics and electronics don't traditionally get along, but I've learned to treat them the same way I treat everybody else, and so we get along okay, and I think that's part of the, the chaos that is me. All right, Dottie. <clears throat> All right, so what we're going to do, uh, hang tight. We're going to jump on Patreon over there. But uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for all you do. This has been a lot of fun. you got a lot of stories, so we're definitely going to have you back on here. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. All right, you have a good night. Safe travel and much profit to you. Bye-bye. And with that, the fire is out. Thank you so much, Dottie. Thank all of you for listening. If you haven't had the chance to connect with me online, Fireside Paranormal Hub on Facebook. I'm also on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, at Fireside Parapod. That's P-A-R-A-P-O-D. If you have not yet joined the Patreon, patreon.com slash Fireside Paranormal, you're missing all kinds of fun things, giveaways, bonus audio, behind-the-scenes conversations, and really so much more. Again, that's patreon.com slash Fireside Paranormal. Tears start at just a dollar. And I also know how bad you want that sweet, sweet, sweet Fireside merch. Make sure you go to firesideparanormal.com, click on that merch tab, and see what's available. There's always a sale going on, so make sure you check that out. Uh, I also want to just thank you all for sticking with me through this EMT class. It has been crazy and very time-consuming, 
Uh, there's only a few weeks left, so you'll start to see episodes coming a little more regularly. Again, you are amazing. Thank you for, for sticking with me, and thank you for supporting the show as much as you do. That is all the time for this week. Until next time, don't be afraid, only believe. Thank you.